Okay, good morning. Um, so uh, that was a really great presentation uh, by Dr. Kleinrock. Uh, and uh, because I've been asked to speak about the future of the internet, of course I'm very intimidated because I think one of the wisest things that he said out of many, many wise things that he said is that it's safe to predict that we'll be unable to predict. So I've got a bit of an impossible task ahead of me this morning, which is imagining the future of the internet. Um, so predicting the future uh, is notoriously difficult. Uh, so I usually try not to do too much of it. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, reporters are often asking me is, uh, they'll say, well, what, what do you think is the next big thing on the internet? And I always say, if, if I knew that, I would start building it right now. Uh, I don't know. Um, but the nice folks here at the Internet Society asked, so here goes. I'll, I'll do it anyway. Uh, because I'm doing it, um, I think uh, we should step into a little bit of perspective. Uh, 20 years from now is 2032. Uh, 20 years ago was 1992, so what does this mean? There's major changes, uh, but unless we hit a technological singularity, we can have a bit of a clue. Um, a lot of what, uh, uh, if we sat down and we were on the internet in 1992, a lot of what we see today was at least plausibly forecastable. Not everything, uh, but a, a fair amount of it. So I think we have some possibility. So I, I've come up with uh, essentially two predictions, and I thought that uh, I would be allowed, since I've been asked to do something impossible and predict the future, uh, to do one safe one and one more speculative one. So the safe prediction uh, is massive connectivity. Uh, and what I mean by this is, is the, just as simple as the number of people online. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what's going on today uh, and some of the things that I think a lot of people, even people in this room, uh, may not have really noticed about what's going on with connectivity. So today, depending on whose numbers you trust, there's about two, mil two billion people who have uh, access to the internet. So what this means is that basically the easy parts are done. Uh, we've got uh, the US and Europe and Japan and uh, basically all of the wealthy countries online. Um, a lot more countries are coming online all the time, increasingly. Um, and so when I think about my work, when I put this into the context of my work, um, you know, the, the vision statement for Wikipedia is to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Well, this is a pretty big task. And uh, when we think about only two billion uh, people are online yet, we obviously have a long way to go to make that happen. So here's what you know. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that I, I love to do is I start to talk to people. Um, I travel a lot. I speak to a lot of different people, not necessarily uh, internet savvy people. Uh, I talk to CEOs of big companies. I talk to uh, volunteers. I've talked to all kinds of people all around the world. Uh, and the one thing that people do, if you start talking to them about the internet in Africa, this is what they'll say. They'll, they'll cite this kind of story. They'll say, oh, yes, I've heard of this. Uh, people uh, on mobile phones in Africa uh, will be able to uh, text somewhere and find out the price of crops, uh, and then they can deliver the crops to the place with the highest price, and their income will go up. And uh, this is really wonderful, amazing thing. Well, that's true enough. Uh, there are things like that going on, but I think that that way of thinking about what's going on uh, with the internet in Africa, and I'm, I'm singling out Africa, but we could, we could generalize this to many, many different places around the world. I think this clouds the mind because there's a lot more going on than that. Uh, here's what you probably don't know. So this is what you do know. You're, you're imagining people are, are just doing very primitive things. What you probably don't know, this phone here, this is my phone. I use this phone uh, every day in, uh, when I'm in the UK, which is most of the time. Uh, and a friend of mine picked this phone up for me in uh, Kenya. Uh, it's an unlocked uh, phone. Uh, so no contract, he just brought me the phone. I stuck in my SIM card, I was, I was off to the races. Uh, it is an Android phone, so it has full capability of apps. If you have an iPhone, it does more or less everything that your iPhone does. The screen's not quite as good. Uh, it's a little bit smaller, but it functions. I'll tell you one thing, compared to every other smartphone I've had in the last three years, the great thing about it is the battery actually lasts more than one day, which is a bit of a miracle. Um, so this phone uh, it has become incredibly popular. This is for sale in Kenya. They have sold, uh, I've seen conflicting figures, uh, but as many as 350,000 of these have been sold in Kenya at the price point of $80. Uh, so this is amazing. So when you think about uh, projects uh, like the, the famous $100 laptop or some of the things that are going on like that, what's coming really, really fast is real, uh, real smartphone technology at an affordable price. Obviously, we're not reaching the poorest of the poor yet, but 
when you think that a phone of this capability has gone from a price of 800 down to 80 in a very short period of time, how much longer does it take until something is available for 40, 20, eight dollars, um, essentially affordable by almost everyone? Let's just take a look at one country, Nigeria, to look at the growth of the internet there. In 2000, 0.1% of the country was online. Uh, these are the ITU numbers. Uh, 2006, 3.1%. 2009, 16.1%. And 2011, 29%. So the kind of growth that we all remember from the dot-com boom days is happening right now in Africa. Um, if you look at, look at the bandwidth, a big part of what's going on in Nigeria, and I, I chose Nigeria. It's a bit of an unfair uh, country to choose because it is one of the points that the, that the undersea cables are being dropped in uh, from Europe. They had 72 megabits in 02, uh, 693 megabits in 07. And then by the end of this year, they're going to have 12 terabits of connectivity dropped into Nigeria. I mean, this is an astonishing thing, uh, which is leading to, although there are a lot of problems across Africa, as uh, we've seen things in many, many different places, uh, with monopoly telecoms and the competition's not quite there, uh, potential regulation and so forth. Uh, but we are beginning to see a crash in the price of backbone internet access, which is going to lead uh, to cheaper retail and so forth, and more and more people coming online. I just recently, this is for fun, this is a, a friend of mine asked to test at the same time. Uh, this is what, he, he was getting a speed in New York. Uh, he has normal broadband in New York, 8.38. I was sitting in Lagos, Nigeria. I got 9.33 megabits. And look at my uplink speed, 11. Uh, he was getting 0.95. So I thought I was better off in Lagos, Nigeria than in New York City. Uh, now, let's be completely fair about this. This is actually, uh, you, you know, the report from speedtest.net says faster than 98% of the internet in, in Nigeria, and that's absolutely true. I was at a fancy hotel uh, right at the, you know, right at the point where the cables dropped in from the sea. Uh, this kind of bandwidth is not common in Nigeria. However, it exists. It's real bandwidth. It's really there. Uh, it's a matter of it being more and more distributed. So what are people doing on the internet across Africa? Are they searching for prices for crops? Are they reporting malaria outbreaks. This is always the kind of do-gooder things that we're all excited about on the internet. Um, yeah, sure, maybe they're doing some things like that, but what they're actually doing is they are on Google. This is very slow clicking. Facebook, if, if we can just click this slide all the way forward, I'm not sure. Twitter, Wikipedia, local newspapers. So what are they, what are they doing online? They're doing exactly the same thing that we're doing. Um, and I think this is the mental shift that I want people to have. If you're thinking about the internet in the developing world and you're thinking about this sort of do-gooder development model, great, that, all that kind of stuff is going to happen, it is happening, but there's something else really, really interesting. What you need to know, if we can go forward, I think my clicker is, uh, if we think forward 20 years about massive connectivity uh, to the real internet for hundreds of millions of people just in Africa, uh, well, keep in mind, these people don't necessarily speak English or French. The era when we can assume, uh, say in India, India is a good example. For many, many years in India, you could assume everybody who had a computer was on the internet. They pretty much all spoke English. This is no longer true there. Uh, the same thing is generally true today. Uh, everyone in Africa who is on the internet pretty much to a, to a significant degree speaks English or French. This is going to change very, very rapidly. Um, and so when we think about my work, imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to some of all human knowledge. We've always been uh, extremely linguistically diverse. And because I was going to Nigeria, I, I went and checked up on how the, Nigeria, uh, how the languages were doing across Africa. And Yoruba, which is the, one of the languages of Nigeria, now has 29,000 articles. I mean, this is pretty amazing to me. I had not been paying attention to Yoruba. Uh, that has more than doubled in the last year. So as we get that connectivity coming in, people immediately start working, they start doing things in their own languages, uh, and this is just part of the natural evolution. And as I say, they're, they're doing exactly the same kind of things that we did, uh, which is they start working on their Wikipedia. Swahili, 23,000. Afrikaans, which is really a, a colonial language, it's Old Dutch, essentially, uh, 22,000. But the truth is, beyond these three languages, uh, most of the languages of Africa are very, very tiny. We have maybe 1,000 articles in two or three more languages, and the rest are very, very tiny. So there is a long way to go. Uh, but the numbers that I'm seeing in terms of masses of people coming online uh, convince me that it's almost time, that it's going to start happening very, very quickly. 
to the conclusion of all this is that the story of the internet in Africa in the next 20 years is not a story about charity, it's not a story about subsistence farmers, it's not a story about SMS. Uh, what it is, it's a story about normalization and joining the global conversation. It's about a rising middle class. So now here's my prediction too, a little more speculative and a little more challenging. Um, no one will notice when Hollywood dies. Uh, this it may, it may be actually optimistic from my perspective of what I'm hoping to see in the world. Um, but this is where I, I begin to try to predict uh, what is unpredictable. What is the next big apps? What are the things that are coming? So for prediction two, uh, that we're going to see large-scale collaborative communities will do to storytelling and filmmaking, in particular, what Wikipedia did to Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, Hollywood will be destroyed. This is where you're supposed to cheer. Um, we're a very diplomatic group here in Geneva. Uh, and nobody will notice much outside nostalgia. Uh, so let's go through and talk about the, uh, a little bit of the sequence of how Wikipedia was created and how I'm seeing some similarities right now in video. So uh, I first came up with the idea for a free encyclopedia for everyone and uh, created a project called Newpedia. Uh, same vision, free encyclopedia for everybody. Uh, but we didn't really have the, the understanding of social communities online and so forth. So it was a very top-down model, uh, more academic than Britannica. Uh, Seven-stage review process to get anything published. And this failed. One of the reasons it failed was that although many, many people were very excited, by the time we uh, moved to the Wikipedia model, there were something like 5,000 people on our uh, email mailing lists and things who had signed up for the project. They had a user account, uh, but they were too intimidated to write by the system. It was too hard to get involved. Uh, and so for volunteers, although they were inspired and wanted to help, uh, we put up so many barriers to, to them being able to help. Uh, that it didn't work. So we learned about the, the concept of a wiki. Uh, of course, the wiki uh, is not something that I invented. Uh, the wiki was first invented by a guy named Ward Cunningham. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that he invented the first wiki in 1995, six years before the founding of Wikipedia. And all the technology for Wikipedia uh, existed for six years. We had a web browser, we had the web server, we had database. Uh, those th things are much older. But even the concept of wiki, of a website anyone can edit, which is a very simple concept in one sense, but Ward Cunningham had to think it up, uh, that it all existed for six years. And it was functional and online. Uh, and yet, um, you know, because of this, I would say Wikipedia is a, not a technological innovation, it's a social innovation. Uh, the older wiki communities tended to hide from the search engines. Uh, there was a belief that if you let too many people come and visit your wiki, they would destroy it. Um, and actually with good cause. Some of the early wikis were actually almost like uh, a performance art in a sense. There was no way, you know how in Wikipedia, if you click on the history, you can go back and see every version of the article in the past. M many of the original wikis, when you clicked uh, the history, there was no history. So if you change something, uh, usually they, they kept two or three versions. You change something, if a malicious person came and made three edits to a page and wiped the page out, you actually lost things. And so there was sort of a, I mean, I remember reading one person's sort of very eloquent essay about, can something as fragile as this really survive? The answer is pretty much no. Um, but what we did is we said, oh, let's save all the history. And uh, that made the wiki much more robust. Um, but people needed time to learn, to build the social mechanisms. Even though the technology existed, nobody really quite knew how you could bring a community together, uh, a, a mainly beneficial community, positive community, really trying to build something for the common good, not just to generate into spam and flame wars and so forth. So now I'm taking a look at the same kind of concept, and I'm thinking about video. Um, other than a few hints here and there, uh, video is in the same state today that text was in 1999. And what I mean by this is that YouTube might as well be GeoCities. How many people remember GeoCities? It was a free homepage provider. It was quite, I mean, for many, many people and that masses of people who came online, it was the first real chance that people had to put up their own web page. And I remember, actually, one of the inspirations for Wikipedia, there were many, but one was there was this really fabulous um, uh, Beatles fan page. A guy had written like 50 pages all about the Beatles. And it was sort of almost a classic thing that you would see on GeoCities. You would see on the front page of a site, I'm so sorry I haven't updated lately. I promise I will. And that would be uh, dated two years prior. Um, that when you have just individual people working on projects, they, 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 get, they move away from it. They, get, they did the Beatles for a while. They got tired of it. They moved on. Um, it's fun, but it's mainly individual contribution. Uh, and so I think that's really important. Another thing I want you to think about in, th in thinking about the, the future of video and the internet is an analogy to tennis and chess. The greatest tennis players tend to start at a very young age. 
Uh, the same thing for the greatest chess players. Uh, to become really, really skilled at something does take a lot of effort, a lot of time, uh, really a, a native fluency with the technology. Um, when I was a kid, it was insanely expensive to produce home video, so no kids were able to touch it. Uh, I wasn't, you know, we, we couldn't even take pictures with a camera. Later, you know, I had a few bucks and my mom would let me take some pictures. But in terms of what kids are able to do today, uh, it's completely different. My daughter's 11 years old. She has an HD camera. She's had it for quite some time now. Um, and she has social companies on the internet that only the most tech-savvy adults have. So they have cameras from a very young age. Uh, my daughter, um, well, I, I came here mainly to brag about my daughter. She won the local county award for her video editing last year. Um, and, you know, basically she just used iMovie, and uh, frankly her movie about how to train a cat is not going to win an Academy Award. Um, but the editing was much better than what I could do because I've never bothered to become very fluent in iMovie. Um, but the point is, the kids coming up today are uh, very fluent in all of this. So here's the magic. Right now, the question is, much like Wikipedia, uh, which ex the technology existed for six years before anybody really put it all together to build something huge, I want to ask ourselves the question, what technologies exist or nearly exist, like Wiki uh, for text, six years before the world takes notice? What's going on right now with young people online uh, who are playing with video, who are doing uh, all kinds of different things uh, that hasn't coalesced into anything coherent or that any of us would recognize and say, wow, that is really huge. And also, if we tie prediction one and two together. Now, mainly in prediction one, I talked about the growth of broadband uh, in the developing world. And that just means the next couple of billion people having the kind of internet access that we have. Uh, but the other aspect of that is that as we're rolling out real broadband to poor places in the world, we'll be rolling out nearly unthinkable to us prehistoric types, bandwidth to teenagers in wealthy countries. I recently caught myself sort of thinking about um, how, how much bandwidth do you need to, uh, to stream video in real time, i.e. from Netflix. Well, I can do that now. And I thought, well, how much more, video, how much more bandwidth do I really need? I mean, why would I possibly want to be able to upload 10 video streams at once from home? Well, that's because I'm an old man who's not thinking about collaboratively sharing with uh, all my teenage friends uh, some video project that we're working on that we can work with as fluidly as we can work with text or uh, uh, JPEG images or what have you. So what does all this mean? Uh, the young people of today, my 11-year-old, uh, are, they'll be 22 before we know it, uh, twice her age, but she will have spent, she's already spent about seven years on the internet, so she's quite fluent. By 22, she'll be very, very fluent. Uh, and these communities of people, this is where I'm going out on a limb, I'm predicting that communities of people, and I'm saying they're going to be young because I'm not going to do it, could be anybody in this room if you get busy and keep up with what the kids are doing, are going to come together and produce Hollywood and better quality films collaboratively. Uh, using large-scale uh, CGI. They're going to be able to, to film with local actors. They can put in explosions and spaceships and whatever it is they need to do. Um, and these will become more popular than Hollywood. Uh, and these will be produced, much as Wikipedia is produced, at very low cost uh, with just a bit of facilitation from various services online. Uh, and it's going to destroy the business model of Hollywood. Uh, never mind the question of piracy, which is a huge problem. I'm, I'm actually more sympathetic than you might think to the issue of piracy. I think that Hollywood is really not seeing what's really coming at them. The real freight train is mass collaboration, mass creativity, uh, where people will be able to create Hollywood quality films uh, in small groups of people working together. Uh, then what? Uh, just after, just as 11 years after the founding of Wikipedia, uh, Britannica has just stopped printing. And in fact, there, there was a little of a blip of a news headline, but honestly, it's uh, nostalgia. I mean, I love Britannica. I still love Britannica. It's a bit of nostalgia because if I think, oh my God, what a loss in my life. I don't have Britannica. I think, actually, I haven't touched my Britannica in about eight years, which is why they can't sell. They sold 3,000 copies, apparently, last year uh, in, in print form. Uh, and so some decade after the first real Hollywood-style collaborative community project where we begin to see high quality, really entertaining, really creative and artistic things coming from communities online, um, Hollywood will be mostly dead and no one will care. Uh, we'll see a few nostalgic stories about, oh, remember when? Uh, so one final caveat. So I've, I've deliberately gone out on a limb here. Uh, I've made a lot of predictions in my life. 
many of them wrong. I'm actually being optimistic there when I say many of them. I would say most of my predictions have been wrong. Uh, and in fact, many of the, the innovations on the internet that, that you went through earlier, I remember when you mentioned Napster, I remember the first time I read about Napster in a news story, and I'm a guy who lives on the internet basically 24 hours a day, and I remember reading a news story about Napster, and they had 25 million users, and I had never heard of it. Uh, so sometimes I completely miss what's going on. Um, and I've deliberately stated this in a provocative way uh, to inspire and motivate you to really think about exactly the point that you made earlier. Um, although I am making a prediction, but in a deeper sense, I'm thinking, gee, there's a lot that's going to happen that is very, very hard to see right now. Uh, it's very hard to know uh, what, what could happen. If you really thought back when I started Wikipedia about how can we best encourage the growth of a, of a large-scale encyclopedia project online, I guarantee you what most of the conversation would have been about is very strong IP protection, uh, digital rights management, all the kinds of things to prevent people from copying it everywhere. You would have been completely wrong about that. Wikipedia, of course, quite famously is freely licensed. You can copy it anywhere, you can do anything you want with it, and it's grown and grown and grown and grown. So I think we have to be very, very careful, uh, in particular when we are listening to the complaints of Hollywood about piracy, which I, as I say, am more sympathetic than you might expect. But I think we also have to recognize that there's a very good chance that their entire production model is going to look really antiquated in just a few years in the same way that we realize that the Britannica production model is really antiquated today. Um, so further, I will say this, uh, the best way to predict the future is to build it. Uh, and so let's build it. So thank you. <laughs>